In our studies in the Psalms, please turn now to a very brief Psalm, Psalm 61. Just eight verses. Psalm 61. And we could call this Psalm, Where to Go in Sadness. However, we'll leave a more positive note in our mind. We'll give it the title, Safe Under God's Protection. Safe Under God's Protection. One of my closest friends was a Roman Catholic. He walked past an open-air meeting one day and was converted He greatly rejoiced to join a Christian church where the Lord Jesus Christ was loved and the Bible was studied. But almost immediately, his family began the most vicious persecution against him. Each time he went home, his heart was broken by the cruel words which were spoken and the extremely cruel actions which were done to him. He resolved that at last he couldn't take any more. He would give up the Christian faith. But he said to himself, before I give it up, I'll go and hear the word of God preached once more. He went to church, like some of you, he arrived late, but for him it was a blessing. Because as he arrived, the pastor was just announcing his text, and the text was, verse 2, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And he cast himself upon God. The tears flowed through the sermon, which he doesn't remember. He received new strength and courage and the unveiling of the presence of God again in his life as he meditated on this psalm. He returned to his family and lived a consistent Christian life in front of them. And today, as I preach, he is preaching as a minister of the gospel. When my heart is overwhelmed... Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now this psalm is a psalm for occasions like that. Christians know what it is to have a broken heart. I've not for years been able to sing the chorus and now I am happy all the day. Because I'm not happy all the day. Christians know what it is to have a broken heart. They know what it is to be overwhelmed. Christians know what it is to come to the point where they say, Lord, this thing is too big for me. Lord, I can't cope with this. I can't go on. Sometimes it's persecution which brings them there. Which is something so devastating that those of you who aren't Christians cannot possibly know the pain of what persecution is. Sometimes they get there through disappointment. Someone lets them down. Sometimes it's some unexpected trouble, or even unexpected trouble. Sometimes it's sheer fear. Christians know about these things. They know about worry. They know what it is to be in perplexity, not knowing which way to go next. They know what it is to be cast down through weakness and illness. They know what loss is. And like you, they know what bereavement is. Well, this, when these things come upon us and our heart is overwhelmed, it's time to open again the 61st Psalm and to read it in the presence of God. This psalm, friends, this psalm was written in sadness. David, when he put pen to paper, although he was a godly man, when he wrote this psalm, he was a broken-hearted man. His own son, his own son had rebelled against him, had betrayed all the trust which had been put in him. And his own son was actually out to murder his father. And David had had to flee from his home. And not only from his home, but from Jerusalem, 
The city he loved because the tabernacle was there. The worship of God was there. He'd had to flee for his life, leaving everything behind. He'd crossed the Jordan. Then, Although he was only just across the Jordan, it seemed to him, verse 2, like the end of the earth. He was in a point in his life where there was no human help, no sympathy, where he was eating the bread of sorrow. His life was a life of overwhelming sadness. Here is a godly man who is at the end, it seems, of his tether. He is overwhelmed. But here he is in the wilderness. And out in the wilderness, a picture suggests itself to his mind. Sometimes he knew the Jordan overflowed onto this flat land. When the Jordan overflowed, well, the floods spread and spread and spread. And he sees those floods as a picture of his trouble. Whichever way he looks, trouble. No escape. But there in the distance, he sees a rock towering above the waters. And he knows if he can but reach that rock, he'll be safe. But he can't find his way. And he can't climb the rock by himself. He must be led to the rock. And he must be helped to establish himself upon the rock. And so he cries, verse 2, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, let's look this morning more closely at this psalm. And let's learn where to go in sadness. And let's learn again this priceless lesson. Safe. Under God's protection. Now there are two movements in the psalm. When we read it, you will have seen that there's verses 1 to 4. And then there is the word selah. That means stop. Pause. Consider. Then the psalm goes on, verses 5 to 8. The first part of the psalm we will call prayer. The second part of the psalm we'll call confidence. So let's look at the first part of the psalm, which is verses 1 to 4. Prayer. Here David cries to God. And as he cries to God, he has a particular request. And with his request, he expects to be heard. And expecting to be heard, he starts making bold promises about the future. Now look at verses 1 and 2 with me. At least verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Where do you cry when you're sad, David? Not to other gods, but to God. Don't you fall out with God, David, when you're in trouble? No. I find that even in trouble, I cannot be bitter against my God. My heart cries out to him. My prayer is little more than a cry. In fact, he uses the word cry twice. But although my prayer is little more than a cry, I cry it nonetheless, and it ascends up to my God as a prayer. And My God, he says, gives me individual attention. I don't let the fact that I'm in the wilderness, verse 2, put me off. I know that wherever I am found, I have open access to God's throne of grace. And I know that whatever comforts I've been deprived of, I will not be deprived of the comfort of prayer. So we see here a man who's cast down, friends. Here is a man burdened, and here is a man crushed. 
But that crushing of the Spirit cannot extinguish prayer. In fact, it is the reason for the prayer. When my heart is overwhelmed, I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Sometimes in my pastoral experience, I've spoken to people, in fact, more than sometimes, many times, and they said, Pastor, I'm too upset to pray. That, friends, is not the language of a broken heart. That is the language of a selfish and bitter spirit. When a believing heart is crushed, and when it appears as if all the life has been crushed out of it, spiritual life still remains in it. And it cannot help but pray. And that is as reliable a thermometer as I know of to find out whether a man or a woman really does have a spiritual and regenerated heart. Because in this book of the Psalms, as we've seen many times, even when a man no longer believes that he belongs to God, he still cannot help his heart crying out to God. Even when his mind seems to contradict everything that he's believed before, there is still that new spiritual life in his heart which moves him naturally to cry out to God. Weeping doesn't drown prayer. Weeping waters prayer. And here is a man crying to God. His request, verse 2, the end of verse 2, is very specific. You'll notice if you look at the end of verse 2, he's not praying for the removal of the trouble. Now, it's a natural thing to pray, but that is not the first desire of a godly heart. When trouble comes into your life, who brings it into your life? God. And because God brings all trouble into our lives, either directly or indirectly, I could never, as my first prayer, pray for the removal of the trouble. Because it may well be the will of God that the trouble should remain. How could then I pray for the removal of the trouble first? David doesn't. David knows that the floods may remain or the floods may go. But as long as he can get to the rock, that will be enough. It doesn't matter whether the floods remain, as long as he can get to the rock which is above the floods. So whether floods come or go, that's not the chief concern of his prayer. His prayer is that he'll be led to the rock higher than himself. Years later, the floods may still be there and show no sign of receding. Indeed, sometimes in a Christian's experience, the floods have got higher and higher and higher. But that is not important to the man who knows that if he's on the rock, however high the floods come, they will never ruin him. So he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The rock which is above the floods. The rock which is unthreatened by the floods. That's what I must have, whether the trouble goes, or whether the trouble remains, or whether the trouble increases. What I must have is conscious communion with God. Because Christ is that rock, you know. Jehovah is the rock, as you would see from the next psalm and the second verse. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How did the martyrs of times past face the flames? They didn't face the flames by the flames being removed. They faced the flames. They faced the flames and showed that incredible courage because they did it in conscious communion with God. That's what sustained them. How did a great evangelist like John Calvin 
spend almost 56 years of his life racked with pain and spend all his waking hours in the service of the kingdom. Because in that busy and fruitful life, he lived it in conscious communion with God. How did Francis Ridley Havergal pen those wonderful hymns which we sing, although she spent the vast majority of her life as an invalid? There's some depth and spirituality and comfort about those hymns, which springs from the fact that in all her pain, God never chose to remove it, but she wrote those words in conscious communion with God. That's how believer after believer has not gone under the floods. You've seen Christians swamped with trouble, trouble which has often broken unconverted people completely. You've seen Christians in pain and worry and heartache and persecution and a thousand other things that pierce the soul in this life. But they've kept going and do keep going because they have been led to the rock that is higher than I. Now as he prays this prayer, verse 3, he expects to be heard. Verse 3 more or less says this, Lord, I've been in the storms before and I found you to, to be a refuge. Lord, I've been surrounded and hounded by the enemy before but I found you to be a strong tower. Now in this short psalm, of course, there are lots of pictures. There's already a picture of a rock and now a shelter and now a strong tower. God is speaking to us in simple words so that none of us can miss the truth. If you were out on the mountains and the storm broke, what would you look for? You would look for somewhere to hide from the storm. That is what God has been to me, says David in verse 3, in the past. He has been a shelter. If you were in warfare and the enemy was chasing you and hounding you and surrounding you, you would look for a fortress which would be entirely safe. That's what God, verse 3, has been to me in the past. That's why David is confident that when he prays to God now to be led to the rock that is higher than I, he's confident that he'll be heard. Because in previous times of trouble, he's found refuge in God. And he is confident that in his present trouble, he will find refuge in the same unchangeable God. You will never find that God is less to you than what he has been already. You will find, incidentally, that he'll be more to you than what he's been already. But you'll never find that he's less. And if you can look back on past troubles, you know that you can expect help in present troubles. If you can look back and see what you've been through already, you can know that you can have the same help even though the floods have come again and they've come higher. However high the floods are, the rock is still higher. However awful the storm is, the refuge is still waterproof. However many the enemies are, the strong tower is unweakened. Because I've been to him in past trouble, I know that I can be heard and will be heard in present trouble. Then in verse 4, in this first section of prayer, he makes bold promises about the future. Verse 4 is a surprising verse. He's far, far from the tabernacle, and yet he says, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. What David means here is that having fled to God in his trouble, he is now going to spend the remainder of his days in the worship and service of God. David knew well enough that the true tabernacle of God is not a tent. That tent was nothing without the presence of God. 
And therefore, if he had the presence of God, he didn't need the tent. Because he had the reality. And therefore, he didn't need the picture. He's confident that although he's out in the wilderness, he will dwell in God's presence forever. And he resolves that he will never now depart from the worship and service of God. In the future, he will not be a selfish wanderer. He takes up another picture there in verse 4. In the countryside, you've been to a farmyard. As you've approached the farmyard, there's been those little squawky, yellow, day-old chicks. And as you've approached the farmyard, they've run from all over the place towards their mother. She opens up her wings, as it were, and you don't just, you just don't believe it. How, how many chicks can get under the feathers of the hen? and not be seen. And there they are all resting under the covert of thy wings. And there's been squeaking and squawking, and suddenly all is silent, because there they rest in the warmth and security of the hen's feathers. God won't have us miss this truth, that he's willing to be like that to us. And David says, In the future, O Lord, I'll dwell in your tabernacle, I'll spend my life in your worship and service. I'll no longer be someone who wanders away from you. I'll be like one of those helpless wee chicks and I'll hide in you. My life in future will be a life of dependence and closeness and intimacy and protection. A a life where I'm aware of my sense of weakness. But a life where I'm aware of your great power. Trouble is a worthwhile thing if it brings us to that position. When I feel weak, then I'm strong. When I'm trembling with fear and I run to the Lord to hide, that is the moment when I have spiritual might. When I am entirely dependent upon him and know very well that I cannot go it alone, That is the moment when I am useful for the Lord and the work gets done. Of all the failings of the Christian church, this is the greatest of them all. That we don't have that sort of dependence, utter dependence, unquestioning dependence upon the Lord. And that's why God sends us trouble to sanctify and bless us That's why unexpected troubles come into our lives. Because when they break upon us, we go scurrying back to God. And once more we enjoy the conscious comforts of our God. And feeling communion with the Lord. And we have courage under his protection. And we're blessed in that relationship of intimacy. Selah. Stop. Pause. Consider. Now let's go to verse 5 to 8, to the end of the psalm. There is David's prayer. Already confidence is growing. But the remainder of the psalm, the remaining four verses, are four verses of confidence. There's some overlap and some underlining in relation to the first half of the psalm. But look at verse 5. He is confident. He is confident that God has heard what he has just prayed. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. He's made a request and he's been confident that that's heard. But he's also made vows. And he's confident that that's been heard. He's made a request to be led to the rock that's higher than himself. But he's also vowed to abide in God's tabernacle forever. And to trust under the covert of his wings. He knows that God hears requests. But he also knows what we sometimes forget. That God hears vows. Sometimes when you've been in distress, you've promised God all sorts of things. But as soon as the distress has gone, 
the memory of those vows is also gone. David wasn't like that. He was confident that the promises he had made to God were as heard as the requests that he made to God. And he was equally confident that God had given to him the heritage of those that fear thy name. In this awful world, Christian friends, there are people who live in the fear of God. Maybe not many in your road or street, maybe very few in your place of study, but they are there. And God has made over to those people certain privileges, the heritage of those that fear his name. And one of the things which they enjoy, which nobody else enjoys, is the comfort of God's presence, and a, which is a foretaste of their future privileges in heaven. One of the great privileges of Christians is to have the conscious comfort of God in trouble. And David in verse 5 is confident that that heritage is his. Let me say it again. Trouble is a great blessing. Spurgeon used to say that the greatest blessing a man can have is good health with the exception of sickness. And the greatest blessing you can have is a life of peace with the exception of a life of trouble. Because trouble lowers us and it brings us afresh to God and we receive the heritage of those that fear his name. Our souls are visited with supernatural comfort and we know like we've never known before that we are his and we know like we never knew in our days of peace. We know like we never knew that we are special to him. How many of you have come into a new assurance that you are special to God in the place of trouble? Well, he's confident also, verse 6 and the beginning of verse 7, that these present troubles will not ruin him. Let me read that verse 6. He's talking about himself. He's the king. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. When we're in trouble, nothing looks bigger than the trouble until we pray. And when we, look, when we pray, the trouble doesn't look half so invincible. To David, it looked all but certain that Absalom would find him out and kill him. But now in prayer, he receives a wonderful assurance which sweeps his soul that he, the king, will have his life prolonged by God. In prayer, he suddenly realizes that Absalom's purposes are going to be thwarted and that his life is going to be preserved, not only for a while, but for many generations. But then, verse 7, his eyes are lifted beyond this life and he has a wondrous revelation for an Old Testament believer. He sees that he shall abide before God forever. So he sees not only that the present trouble won't ruin him, not only that he will have a long life, but that his enjoyment of God will never end. Wonderful that. It's a common experience for troubled believers. Very often we walk this world, we're almost totally this worldly. Trouble shakes our earthly security. Once more we're brought to realize that this world is very uncertain. It's passing. And we're easily removed from it. But sometimes at moments like that, we catch a glimpse of the eternal dimension. And we see that our enjoyment of God isn't only for now, and not only for the years ahead, but our enjoyment of God is forever. And the trouble puts all our sights into perspective. And we see that trouble is for this life only, but we shall be free from it in the next. And it's a wonderful thing to catch a sight of heaven, even while on earth. 
And sometimes it only happens in the place where our heart is breaking. How then could you grumble about trouble when it often brings you to that point? And therefore, not unnaturally, he closes the psalm by praying to God to preserve him. You see, David now sees that he's going to heaven. He sees that the journey ahead of him is a long one because the king's life is going to be prolonged. He's now concerned not only about the present trouble, the present awful trouble, but he's also concerned that he'll have the help of God the whole journey through. He can't abide the thought of taking a wrong step and walking off the heavenly pathway. He can see that present trouble isn't going to ruin him, but he's now afraid that he might be ruined by a future one. And so he cries for God's covenant love to go in front of him, God's mercy. And he prays for God's truth to prepare the way. He prays, in short, for the protection and preservation of God the whole journey through. And if God does that, he says, verse 8, then it will redound to God's praise. Because if God will preserve me the whole of my journey through, I'll praise God not just at the present, but forever, but forever, but forever. And every step of the journey will be a day spent pleasing God, performing my vows which I've made in the present distress. So it's a simple, straightforward psalm filled with helpful pictures. We close by asking some questions again. Are you this morning in any sort of trouble? Maybe overwhelmed by it. Perhaps conquered by sadness. Then will you not now find a quiet place on your own? Open your Bible again at Psalm 61. And make this prayer your own. Saying, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I.